Okay, uh, good morning everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Um, so uh, here we are with, uh, a, I think, the seventh seminar of the Machine Learning for Science series. And uh, uh, today um, we stay in the American continent, although we go to Canada. And uh, it is my big pleasure to introduce you to Isaac Tamblin from uh, the uh, National Research Council of Canada and also both University of uh, Ottawa and uh, uh, the Vector Institute. Um, so for those of you who do not know uh, Isaac, uh, um, he uh, is a Canadian citizen. I mean, he graduated in Canada and then moved to a postdoc position in uh, uh, Lawrence uh, Berkeley and also the Molecular Foundry. And then went back to Canada uh, and now is a senior scientist uh, um, at the National Research Council. And um, in the last few years has developed quite a, a, an interesting program in uh, uh, try to see how artificial intelligence and machine learning can uh, uh, enable physical sciences. Um, so I guess without any further ado, I would like to give a stage to Isaac and just remind to all of you that uh, uh, please keep in mind your question um, and uh, uh, post the question uh, online uh, to the chat box. It uh, would be better if you post the question as the question comes to your mind and then I will read them at the end of the presentation. Uh, please. So thanks very much uh, and thank you everyone who uh, is, is watching this live and, or after in the recording. Uh, I just want to, uh, to start off my presentation by uh, acknowledging the really great uh, team of, of young researchers who have uh, really been uh, instrumental in, in this work. I have the, the great job where I get to, uh, to work with this really talented team and, and uh, none of the work that, uh, that I've done here today would have been possible without these people. Uh, uh, so these are the people, sort of current and former group members who, uh, who were involved in, in the various work that I'm going to talk about today. So I think we'll uh, we'll sort of start off um, by just sort of for briefly letting you know. So in some of the previous sorry, Isaac, seminars, Isaac, sorry, yeah. it looks like there is a problem with you with YouTube. I cannot see the streaming actually. Hold hold on a second. Um, apologies for that. No problem. Okay, no, it is live. Okay, so was my my mirror was not correct. Okay, apologies. Yeah, we're good sorry. to go. Yeah, yeah, sorry. No problem. So uh, just to give you kind of a sense of the, the type of work that goes on in my group. Um, so, you know, we're sort of interested in applying methods of, of deep learning and AI in various problems within uh, the sort of the physical sciences, particularly in kind of physical chemistry uh, and in nanoscience. And so these are sort of just sort of vignettes of different projects that we've done. Uh, and to just give you the kind of the sense of what's gone on, we've done work with spin models and sort of quantum combinement. Uh, we've sort of focused a lot on 2D materials, doing things like electronic structure theory and density functional theory, uh, with some work in sort of perovskites and 3D materials. I also uh, am a big fan of sort of applying these methods uh, in areas of sort of thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. And then more recently, we've uh, we've done work with sort of valleytronics, self-assembly, uh, uh, and disordered materials. And so, so these are kind of the, the physical domains where we've been focusing on uh, sort of applying methods. And uh, just to give you kind of an idea of the ac or, uh, acronym soup uh, that is uh, modern AI, uh, some of these things might be familiar to you, other, others not. So we've worked with things like, you know, sort of simple, uh, fully connected artificial neural networks, uh, obviously things like convolutional neural networks. At some point, we realized that those had some limitations, and so we had to come up with our own design, something called an extensive deep neural network. And then, of course, we've used things like sort of inverse graphics networks, uh, variational autoencoders, um, you know, recurrent networks that I'll talk about uh, a bit today. And then we've done work with uh, sort of evolutionary learning and reinforcement learning and kind of deep Q learning uh, and, and generative models. And so, you know, over, I guess, uh, the past number of years, the, the goal has been trying to like, you know, flex the muscles and uh, and kind of understand and, and really interrogate all of these interesting methods and make modifications to them so that we can uh, can do great science with them. And so I'm obviously not going to be talking about all of these things, but just to give you sort of an idea of the, the work that goes on in the group. And so I think, though, to, to kind of bring things into focus, we'll, we'll start with, uh, with a, a favorite experiment of mine, 
which involves a paperclip. So, so at some point, if you are a scientist, uh, you will have encountered a, a child, and, and the child will in, invariably have a lot of questions for you. You know, what is electricity? How does that work? Uh, what is magnetism, and, and so on. And so, the one experiment that uh, that I, you know, you, you like to do as a child, or you like to do with kids, and involves paperclips and magnets. So, so we're going to talk about that very briefly. So, suppose that you have, you know, a pile of paperclips. We know that you can uh, you can get a magnet, so like this little horseshoe that I have here. And, and, and what do we know about magnets? So if we take the magnet and we put it by the paper clip, we can uh, we can maybe pick up one of the paper clips. Uh, and, and then the next thing that you know, when you start to explore magnets and paper clips, you say, oh, wasn't this interesting? If I kind of take my paper clip and I rub it against my magnet a couple times, uh, you know, it seems like uh, something interesting can happen. So. What do I mean by that? If we uh, remove the paper clip, I can now, or the magnet rather, I have this paper clip and, uh, and people love to discover that in fact, I can actually magnetize the paper clip. And, uh, and, and so that's sort of exciting. And, and so when, you know, when someone asks you about magnetism, they say, how does it work? You say, well, there's these sort of domains. And, and when we do the rubbing against the magnet, what we're doing is sort of ordering the domains. And so a magnet is something where all the domains are aligned. Um, and, uh, you know, so some children can be pretty precocious and say, well, I don't, I don't think I really understood from anything about magnetism with that. And I, and I kind of agree that it's a little unsettling as the final answer. But, you know, we try and wave our hands in the air and say, OK, now you've discovered magnetism. There's a second part of the experiment, uh, which you can kind of if you want to up the magic a little bit, which is you say, well, you know, if this didn't impress you, why don't we uh, why don't we bring in some fire into the mix? And so you can sort of take these two paper clips, which you have now magnetized. Uh, and you can heat them up. So maybe you get a blowtorch or you get an oven. And what you will find is that spontaneously at some point they will actually demagnetize and they'll fall on the floor. And so, you know, there's a question of why does this happen uh, and how hot does it need to be? And so how do, how do we sort of interrogate this system as a physicist? And, 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 and maybe before I explain that, the reason that I, that I kind of want to take this example of magnetism and spins is because it's a, a very simple physical model that's sort of familiar for uh, for most students if you you know pass the second year in, in, in chemistry, sort of this idea of interactions and temperature. Um, but it's something that if we kind of use kind of these new modern methods, we can really kind of push them to their limits and figure out why they work, where they fail and so on. And so for this lecture is really going to be about taking kind of interesting uh, deep learning and AI tools, but then applying to this to a very sort of simple model that is, that is well understood uh, so that we can see what we can learn from that. So how do we sort of treat the, this kind of thing theoretically? So a very simple model is we say we have these spins, the sort of the, the white and the black uh, squares, which would denote sort of up or down respectively. Uh, and at finite temperature uh, and at sort of constant mole and volume, what you can think about is the system uh, evolves through a series of microstates, um, which are, you know, each one of these things forms a, a chain of a Markov decision process. And, uh, you know, these spins have this property that if we sort of apply the external field in one direction, they will all align. So this is what happened when we use the horseshoe magnet. And if we were to, say, apply a field in another direction, then they all go in, uh, in the other direction. But at finite temperature, there's always going to be some excitations within the system. And so you're going to have spontaneously uh, that some of the sp uh, spins will flip in direction. And that, you know, sort of the warmer the system gets, you're going to get these larger and larger fluctuations. And of course, there is going to be some point at which this, uh, this whole thing breaks down and you get uh, spontaneous demagnetization. And the way that we sort of treat this thing uh, classically and, and simply uh, statistically mechanically is we use something which is called the Ising model. So the Ising model is a simple model uh, where we say each one of these spins interacts with its nearest neighbor through some coupling term J. Uh, and in its simplest form, we assume that J is uniform across the entire lattice. And you can also sort of explore effects due to the external field where you say that the, the spins have, again, some other coupling constant uh, where they, they connect to the external field. And so the, the model is quite nice because it, uh, it's one of the simplest model that undergoes a continuous phase transition. And, and we're going to kind of explore a little bit some of the, the properties of this model. So one of the things that you notice immediately is that it has two degenerate ground states. So if all of the spins are aligned up uh, or if all of them are aligned down, for the case of the ferromagnetic Ising model, so that means that J is equal to a positive number, 
uh, you will have two degenerate ground states. This is in the absence of a magnetic field. And you can uh, in, sort of visualize what the nearest neighbor interaction is, is we focus on one spin in the middle, it's going to connect with the, the ones in its nearest neighborhood. So in this case, for this kind of lattice, there are four nearest neighbors. And in this case, this is sort of an unfavorable interaction for the case of the ferromagnetic Ising model, because you have uh, that negative one is opposing direction to the, all the other spins in its neighborhood. And we can actually sort of simulate finite temperature dynamics, these fluctuations using an algorithm called Metropolis Hastings. So in Metropolis Hastings, what we do is we will randomly select a spin, we will flip it, and if the energy is favorable, i.e. the energy goes downhill when you make a move, we're going to accept that move and we'll take that as our new configuration. But if it, the flip is one that is unfavorable, so the energy goes uphill, then what we'll do is we're gonna accept that with some probability given by the Boltzmann weight. And so if you, uh, if you take uh, a lattice, so here's an example of a, a simulation of an Ising model of an, I think it's an eight by eight lattice here. And what we did is we did the Metropolis Hastings algorithm many, many times. So we choose spins, flip them, and we accept in one direction uh, if it goes downhill and accept with a probability, which depends on the temperature, uh, if it goes in the other direction, we can record in our computer to see what the average magnetization is that is explored by our system as a function of temperature. And so if you look uh, to the left-hand side of the plot, when the temperature is very, very low, we see that the average magnetization uh, is close to one, so this is per spin, which means that you're very, very likely to find all of the spins pointing either in the positive direction or the negative direction. And then as you increase the temperature very, very high to the far right-hand side of the plot, you can see that the average magnetization is zero. So you kind of have sort of like a random spins up and spins down. And of course, there's some point at which the, uh, the system undergoes this change. And this is something that we call the critical temperature. And you, and you can see how this curve here is not completely perfect in the sense that you have little notches and bumps and things like this. And this is an artifact of the fact that we, you know, we only ran our simulation for a certain amount of time. Uh, the longer that you run, the, the more that you can get the variance down. Uh, and you'll find actually that you get interesting properties of the variance around the phase transition or the, the critical temperature. Okay, so how do you attack this problem in terms of something like deep learning? So again, we have this lattice of, of spins, ups and downs, and you can kind of think about them in terms of this being a picture. Uh, it's sort of like a checkerboard, right? So if I color the ones as being up and the negative ones as down as black, so this is one checkerboard pattern that you could have. You could have another checkerboard pattern here where you have these spin blocks, and this is gonna result in some other sequence. And so what we did to sort of in our initial explorations, we said, well, what can you do with something like supervised machine learning? What can we learn with this system? And we said, well, let's describe the spin coordinates as the, uh, the sort of collectively the X variables or, uh, of the system. So the, in, uh, in machine learning, you might call these something like the features of the system, the raw features, and then the energy and the magnetization, right? So those interactions between them or the signs of the spin, these are going to be the labels of our system. And, you know, sort of trivially, you can compute many, many uh, different configurations of these things uh, very cheaply on a computer, and we can generate lots of, uh, of labeled training data. And so we say, okay, now if we have this training data, uh, what happens if you try and sort of learn the mapping from the labels, so this, or rather the, the, the features, the spins to the labels? Is, is there an architecture that can work with this? And so in our sort of initial explorations, we said, well, why don't we sort of take something which was not designed at all for magnetism, but was actually designed to solve the zip code problem. So when I lived in California, my zip code was 94705. And whenever someone sent me mail, uh, there was a computer that needed to read in that zip code uh, so that they could uh, route the mail properly. And so you can see here's an example of optical character recognition uh, from uh, a number of years ago. And the way that they've solved sort of this problem of optical character recognition is using something called a deep convolutional net. So this is a very famous one called LENet. There's been uh, a lot of work that's gone on since then. And what they do is they basically read in the data and they take a series of, uh, of convolutions which automatically extract the features through backpropagation, where the final output layer is going, in this case, can be a classification layer which tells you uh, what number you're looking at. Convolutions are, uh, are very powerful uh, pieces of, uh, of 
kit, I would say, in terms of uh, modern deep learning, if you're not familiar with what a convolution is discreetly uh, on, a, on, on a grid, the wonderful thing about this field in my mind is that people share so much information. So if you just, here's a quick Google, Google search where you can see uh, Apple has given sort of a nice uh, example here. Uh, a convolution is really just a, a mask that you apply to some data. So suppose that you have source data on the left-hand side, which is some regular matrix uh, with different numbers in it. So this would be sort of the, the zero to 255 bitmap that you would see in a grayscale image or in our case it's going to be the the ones and minus ones for the for the Ising model and then we're going to apply this kernel which is that three by three matrix in the middle where in this case the kernel is zero everywhere except for the top left and the bottom right where it's four and minus four the way that you apply a convolution discreetly is you just take that mask you apply it over your data and then you're going to do an element by element multiplication you can see there that I've done it out on the right and you're going to get a single number which is the negative eight and then we're going to store that number in this new matrix and then what we'll do is we take what's called a stride and so we move that mask over by either one or some larger number of steps and we do that math over and over again and we're going to produce a new output uh, receptive field uh, which has basically been uh, featureized. And so I can give you kind of an example of what this looks like for a photograph. So a couple of years ago, I took a, I was in Hong Kong at a, giving a seminar and I took a photograph of this, uh, of this boat here while I was uh, on tour. And just to show you what it looks like if you take a convolution. So if we convert this to a grayscale image, so you can see the little boat. If I apply this kernel, the one that I showed you the example before, if I apply that kernel to the image on the left, what I get out as an output is the the image on uh, on the right there, and so you can see that it sort of enhanced some uh, some aspects of the photograph, and it sort of uh, reduced some other ones. If I apply a different type of kernel to the same image, then I get a different uh, output. And uh, in deep supervised learning, it's these numbers within the kernel; those are the things that are actually being parameterized and learned through the active back propagation through a, a large amount of data. Okay, so if we if we take this sort of this kind of stock off the shelf at this point convolutional network and we apply it to something like spins, uh, how well does it do at, at learning the energies? And, and I can't emphasize enough, this is sort of a, a silly thing to do in the sense that, you know, the Ising model is cheap to simulate on a computer. You don't need a, a neural net from it. But we really wanted to sort of figure out where the problems were going to be and, and, and how well this thing was going to work. So this is sort of an old slide that we, we took and we said, okay, let's take different size uh, training set sizes. So we're just sort of generating more and more configurations with, uh, with features and labels. We apply it through the convolutional net. And now what we're plotting is the accuracy that we're getting from our model after training as a function of the training set size. And so you can see you get to about 40% accuracy after about 2,500 configurations. Uh, and then, you know, once you go up to something like, say, uh, 5,000 or, or even 10,000, you get pretty good accuracy, or at least it looks like it uh, at this point. So now we have this trained model. Uh, I wanted to say, okay, well, like, how good is it at, uh, at reproducing the data? So can we use the model to actually now do the metropolis hastening simulation we did before, but rather than calling on the function that we had in code to, uh, to evaluate the Hamiltonian, can we do a call out to our model where our model predicts the energy? How well does it do? So we tried that, and uh, so the black curve is the result that you get from just using your, your normal Hamiltonian. Uh, and now we tried it with our, uh, with our model, and what we found was that it was okay, but it wasn't great. Um, so at first you kind of look at this and say, well, you know, why is this not happening? We thought we had pretty good, uh, we thought we had pretty good accuracy, and yet somehow what we're finding actually is that we're not able to, uh, to reproduce the physics. And so the solution to this problem actually comes into not looking at the accuracy of your system, which in this case, it was quite good. So we had an accuracy uh, on that last slide of 99.42%. But what matters is you actually have to look at your accuracy across your classes or as a function of energy. And so here, what we're plotting is the error that we saw in different classifications. This is a classification model that we did as a function of the energy. And what you can see that is that the errors are actually quite high uh, relatively speaking, or it's a, an imbalanced error that you get as a function of energy. So it's quite high at the bottom of the distribution and at the top of the distribution. Um, and those things correspond to these sort of uh, these edge cases of sort of all up, all down, or, or in the case of the ferromagnetic Ising model, checkerboard model. So why is that? So to diagnose, uh, diagnose this, we kind of focused intently on a, on a simple, small one, a 4x4 four four Ising model. And what we did is we calculated something which is called the density of states. Uh, for the model. And what the density of states does is it tells you how many configurations you have 
that have certain uh, parameters associated with them. So in this case, we looked at, we calculated the energy and magnetization of different configurations. And then we just counted how many uh, configurations fall within this sort of 2D histogram. And you get this kind of interesting triangle shape. Uh, and you can see that uh, there are a very, very large number of configurations right in the middle of the triangle. So that's the red. This is on a log plot. And there are very few configurations uh, at the ends. There's only, you know, sort of one, all, one configuration of all black and one configuration of all white. And then you get the, uh, the two checkerboards. There are a very, very large number of these low symmetry configurations, which makes sense when you think about it entropically. And so what we were actually seeing here, because of how we were kind of preparing our data, is that we had very, very large number of examples. We were just sort of randomly generating data. We had large number of examples of this one sort of disordered class, but we had very few examples of the highly ordered ones. Uh, and so although we had an accuracy of, you know, 99.42%, uh, we actually had accuracy in uh, not the kind of the regime that we needed it in. And so the solution that this is basically an example of what's called unbalanced classes. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're reading any of the machine learning blogs, which I, I would really encourage everybody to do if you're working in this field, uh, this is kind of like a, a very known old problem. Uh, and there's some pretty easy solutions, either resampling your data or changing your loss function to have sort of a class or energy dependence and so on. So then if you actually fix your, your class imbalance problem, what you find is that uh, in this case, we did it with oversampling of our, our low uh, sort of edge case classes, you will get an accuracy which goes lower. Um, but uh, it actually turns out to be more accurate where you need it to be. And so now here's an, an example where we show sort of the, the reference curve where we use the true Hamiltonian uh, for the same system size. And then now the red curve is actually with our uh, class balanced uh, deep neural network. What's neat about these things is you can actually start to make predictions for multiple things simultaneously. So a process called cooperative learning. Uh, so you don't need necessarily one a uh, network for energy and one for magnetization or other properties, it turns out the act of predicting multiple properties concurrently can actually help with the learning process of each individual ones. Uh, just because some uh, properties as the output are going to, some of them will be sort of more sensitive at the early learning stages and the, the kind of the, the low layers of your network to features which turn out to be important uh, for other properties uh, and they can do fine tuning on it. So we apply cooperative learning and then in this case we actually learned both the Hamiltonian and the magnetization operator simultaneously and so then this is the output from our from our curve here uh, and there's a reference there below. Okay, so um, we've sort of shown at this point that yeah, you know, supervised uh, machine learning it can kind of if you if you do it right and you balance it on the spin systems you can you can pull out some physics, uh, which is good, right? This is sort of what we expected, but we wanted to kind of push it past the limits. So in the previous example. I, uh, I said, imagine that, you know, you, you can basically do whatever you want. You have as much training data as you want, and you're kind of playing a game. Now we want to play a different game where we say, what can we, um, what can we actually extract if you only are allowed to do a single experiment? So imagine that it's the first day of graduate school, and, uh, you know, your, your professor, she says, okay, you are allowed to, to do one experiment for the entirety of your degree. You can collect as much data as you want with that experiment, but you're only allowed to have uh, one set uh, on, on the knob. So, you know, be, choose very wisely what pressure and temperature uh, and mole number uh, or that, uh, that you want to run this experiment at because we're only allowed to set the knobs once. I, I'm not sure why she does this, but uh, this is the challenge that she gives you. You're allowed to do one experiment. You can collect lots of data, um, but uh, what can you actually predict from that data? And so this is the experiment that we want to play now. And so specifically, uh, I want to say, like, imagine in this paperclip example, imagine that you're allowed to observe the paperclips at only one particular temperature, but you now have to predict what the behavior is going to be for all other temperatures. So we've already sort of established that we can think about this, uh, the simple model of magnetism is we have these different spins on a lattice. And at this point, I said, you know, we have these different checkerboards. Um, in the first talk, I sort part of the talk, I said, okay, kind of think about this thing as a, as a picture the way that you would have with like handwriting recognition. Now I want to take the exact same type of data, but I actually want to do a different operation on it. What I want to do is I want to take the, the sort of the, the ones and minus ones, but I want to apply this sort of, uh, the spiral to it. And I want to, uh, uh, apply this spiral where I unwrap the data. 
So rather than going from sort of a square grid, I want to apply this spiral operation where I unwrap the data into the sequence. And now you might wonder, you know, does the spiral, what's magical about the spiral? The answer is nothing. You can also use what we would call a snake. You can kind of uh, imagine a snake going back and forth uh, and, and you get very similar results. So, so everything that I'm going to show you here is not sensitive to the unwrapping procedure, provided that you choose one which is, you know, reasonable uh, and consistent. Um, and so once you've taken your configuration and you've sort of unwrapped it uh, this way, you get what looks like a sequence, right? So we go from sort of a regular grid. So now we have in this case, you know, negative one, one, negative one, and so on. And uh, in sequences, this is sort of another area in, uh, in deep learning where there's been a lot of progress in the last number of years. So uh, if I sort of, if I put up this, uh, the beginning of this sentence, you know, the chicken, uh, if you, uh, if you, if English is, is your first language and you like jokes, maybe you've heard sort of the next part of the sentence, which is cross the road. It immediately evokes in your mind, cross the road. Uh, and, uh, the reason that it kind of, it triggers that is that you've either heard that before, or you've heard sort of the beginning part of a sequence and your mind starts to fill in the next part of the sequence. You can also do it in French. Um, sequence models have been, uh, been very powerful in terms of doing translation. So text translation from, from one language to the other. Um, and uh, we actually, I used a, uh, a neural network translation uh, feature to, to go from one thing to the other. And so there are different ways that you can sort of handle sequence models. Um, one of the kind of the most powerful ones that uh, that made the, the most progress uh, uh, recently, uh, but is, has now been superseded, was something called a recurrent neural network. So a recurrent neural network is interesting because it is a, a network which feeds back on itself some portion of the output. So you can see that there's this uh, input, which is the green that's coming in here from the bottom, so this would be whatever your signal is in some representation. And then on the left, these hidden units uh, that are also feeding in together, those are actually connected. Uh, they're, they're the activation or part of the activation of the network from the previous step. So every time that the network is outputting something, we're saving some of that output and we're feeding it into the network again uh, to do the, the next step in the sequence. And so there are sort of different things that you, uh, different types of activation neurons that you can use. There's, there's the original sort of just uh, simple recurrent neurons, then sort of moved on to things called LSTMs and uh, GRUs and so forth. Um, but uh, sort of conceptually in terms of uh, how these things work in terms of the output, they're all, they're all very similar in that they can read in a sequence. Uh, we're feeding in sort of part of the previous output uh, into the next part of the sequence. And then we're starting to make predictions for what the next part of the sequence is. And, and, and just uh, for clarity, uh, typically what we'll do is we'll initialize those hidden units uh, randomly for the first part of the sequence. Okay, so that's uh, the idea of sequence models that they can start to predict the next part of the sequence. How can we have that help us with, uh, with something like statistical mechanics? So if you kind of think back to first year StatMech, we know that the probability of observing a single microstate, uh, so that's sigma i here, is just given by the Boltzmann weight of that microstate. So basically it's energy multiplied by the inverse temperature exponentiated divided by the partition function, where the partition function is just this, uh, the normalization function that comes from the sum over all the Boltzmann weights. So that's the probability at uh, finite temperature in the canonical ensemble that you will observe a particular microstate. The uh, relative probability of two microstates, so just taking a divide, dividing the two of them, you can uh, sort of, with a little bit of algebra, uh, you can show that that relative probability is going to give you the energy difference between the two microstates, so the delta between the i's and the j's. So this is something that sort of, you know, is well known, and in fact is what we make use of in, uh, in Monte Carlo in terms of actually simulating these things. And we said, well, can we use this probability that we have from StatMech and can we connect it to the probabilities that we're getting from our sequence models? Because if you think about a sequence model, uh, the way that they actually work is when I sort of start the sentence, the, there's a probability distribution over all the possible words that could come next. So the chicken would sort of have maybe a, a, a relatively high probability, but the the has a very low probability. When you say the once, the next word is definitely not the, but the chicken has a finite probability. And if you then go the chicken crossed, 
So you select chicken, the conditional probability for cross is going to be then different and much higher than it would have been if you said some other word, um, you know, like the dog, maybe dogs are less likely to cross a road and they're more likely to eat something. I, uh, you know, apologies to dogs and chickens. So what we can do is we can actually train a sequence model on these long spin sequences and we can chain together a sequence of conditional probabilities which allow us to uh, learn the sort of, not only can we learn the probability distribution of this entire sequence was out of our data distribution. So that's something that sort of uh, can be done with these kind of models. And then if you sort of put on your physics hat and you say, oh, well, that's interesting. So the probability that my sequence model is giving me is actually equivalent to what I would expect as the probability that statistical mechanics says it is, then all of a sudden, if you connect those two things, you have the ability to estimate the difference in energy between two microstates. So this is, you've only ever observed spins, so microstates of different spins, and you've only ever observed them at finite temperature, you never change the temperature knob, but using sort of this idea uh, in uh, sequence models and uh, conditional probabilities, we can associate that with a physical quantity, which is the energy difference between these two spins. That energy difference is exactly the kind of thing that you need to do Metropolis-Hastings modeling. And so uh, here's a sort of an example of how our RNN energy model uh, did compared to ground truth. So on the, the left-hand side, we're plotting the energy of some particular spin minus the average across the entire distribution. And we're plotting that versus the energy of that same spin minus the average. And you can see that on the predicted versus true plot, uh, the data pretty much lies on the line y equals x, which is a good sign. There's a bit of, you know, sort of above and below variance to that. It's not a perfect model. Uh, but if we just take this model as it is, and in the same way that we used the convolutional net last time to sort of insert into our Monte Carlo, now if we call our RNN energy model to, to solve it, uh, we can actually start to make predictions in uh, Metropolis Hastings of what the properties of the system are going to be as a function of temperature. And so this is now a pretty familiar plot, but uh, to just walk you through it. So what are we showing here? So we collected all of our observations. The one experiment that we did on that, you know, that day in grad school when our advisor said you're only allowed to choose one temperature, we chose an observation temperature of four. And we collected a large amount of data on that day. And then what we did is we trained our sequence model. We came up with an RNN energy model based on that data. And then we did a whole bunch of simulations where we made predictions for what the magnetization would be as a function of temperatures which were different than our observation temperature. So we're actually able to essentially extrapolate accurately across all temperatures within the system. So the black curve is a reference curve that you, you get if you just use the standard, um, the standard operator for the energy. And then the RNN uh, is showing you what you get as the average and the variance if you use the uh, the prediction for the magnetization as a function of temperature. So, so this is pretty cool, um, but we can actually push it a little bit farther. So I've added something now into the map. So initially we had sort of these configurations. If you follow on the left, we have the spiral where we unwrap them into a sequence. We're gonna then train an RNN model on that. We use conditional probabilities to get an estimate for the probability. And then using StatMech, we can associate that probability with this delta E. So that's that upper track. The other thing that we can do is we can say, well, what about if we use some, now that we have this label, which the RNN has sort of produced, what if we actually start to use those labels to train a second network. So we're going to take the same configuration, so now on the bottom, and we're going to feed that configuration to something which is called an extensive neural network, which I'll talk about in a moment, and we're going to train the extensive neural network on the delta E's. So an extensive uh, neural network, the idea here is that, um, you know, sort of in the, it, anyone who's sort of done these training will realize that, you know, at some point you have this problem where you've trained your sort of network at one length scale. So, you know, sort of uh, lattices or molecules or something like that. And then if you want to use it for a larger scale system, you have the problem that, you know, the, the, the dimension problem. And the way that they work is they're very similar to a convolution. Um, but uh, what you do is you basically take your data. So here's an example of some binary data on the top. And what we're going to do is we take that data and we replicate it out 
with some context around each focus point. So if you kind of focus on the red there in the top part, and then you imagine padding out context, this is the additional information that you would need within that focus area to decide what the energy is. We're gonna do that for each part of the image. So we're gonna create multiple of these replica tiles and we are gonna construct uh, uh, either a network, so you can technically you can do this with any machine learning model. It doesn't need to be a deep uh, neural net. You can do this with SVMs. You can do this with random forests and so forth. And we simultaneously feed each one of these replicated tiles, which have the different contexts around them, through uh, some sort of machine learning model where we require that the weights of the model be identical through each one of those channels. So the red, the yellow, the blue, and the green weights are all the same. And then we bring them all together in a final connected layer where we said that the sum of these things has to be equal to the extensive quantity, which is the energy. And when you do that, uh, you sort of force extensivity onto the system and you also force uh, the idea of locality onto the system in the sense that you know operators are the same uh, operate the same in different parts of space and there's some sort of field of view that the operator has. And what this does is it lets you train on a small scale system, so something like say an 8x8 Ising model uh, or maybe a, a small scale molecule or solid or something like that. And you can take that model and then you can then deploy that model on a system which is much, much larger that you've never seen in your training set. So on the left-hand side, we're plotting the extensive uh, the energy from our extensive neural network versus the, uh, the recurrent neural network. And you can see that there's very good agreement. And now on the right-hand side, we've done, again, the Metropolis uh, sampling with that model. And this is for a larger Ising model than we ever did a simulation on. And so that's why I don't even have the vertical line now at four. So we did all of our data collection was at a temperature in KB of four for the small scale spin model. But now we're making predictions for a larger scale synth model that was never seen in training uh, and we're doing it across the entire uh, temperature regime. And you can see that you get excellent agreement with the, uh, the traditional way of doing this simulation. So now we're extrapolating not just in the temperature but also across the, the, the size scale of the system. And what I really like about this and was sort of surprising is that if you actually, so we have these two energy models, the RNN energy model uh, and we have the extensive deep neural network model, the EDNN. The EDNN has actually trained on the output of the RNN. It never saw real labels. But if you then take the EDNN and then you compare it against the true labels, we actually see that the variance is smaller on the EDNN and it's closer to ground truth, uh, which is really neat because you've added sort of more physics in the construction of your model. It's never actually seeing the real data, but you get better predictions within your system. So the more physics that you can add into these things, the better. You can also, uh, we studied sort of different systems, not just sort of Ising models. We looked at uh, things called POTS models. So a POTS model is where you have uh, multiple states that each spin can take. Uh, and we did something called a spin glass. So there you have sort of fully random couplings uh, locally. Now spin glasses uh, are sort of an interesting system too um, because they're a much more challenging to actually to equilibrate and to, to sort of sample within the system. So there's a, a large body of literature that's sort of focused on this. And, and this brings me into sort of my, my next topic here, which is that, you know, so now we've sort of shown that, uh, you know, we can learn from a single experiment, but what about if I actually want to start to, to take control of a system? What if I actually want to say, how can I sort of guide a system to the ground state? Uh, it turns out that sort of uh, finding the, the ground state of things like spin glasses is a, is a very general problem and can be applied to problems in optimization. Uh, there's uh, a sort of this idea of a, a Kubo problem, uh, which is an uh, unconstrained uh, optimization problem, which you know you can solve problems like the traveling salesman and, and so on. And so getting to the ground state of a spin glass is actually something that's sort of interesting, both sort of fundamentally, but it also has some, uh, some interesting technological applications. And so we said, well, can we use uh, sort of deep learning and AI to try and find the ground states of these optimization problems. And so we came up with an algorithm that did it. Uh, you know, we gave it a funny name, which is cool. So it's controlled online optimization learning. Uh, and, and we call it that because basically what we want to do is we want to cool down the system and, uh, and we want to find its ground state. And so the, the PhD student that, uh, that led the work here, uh, you know, I think uh, produced this wonderful image here uh, on the left that I'm going to kind of take you through to explain the project. So, so let's, uh, what did we do here? Right. So, so the idea is, is we're going to do uh, something which is called reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is another type 
of uh, sort of modern or AI methods. It's actually a very old method. The, so the RL literature starts back in sort of the 1960s, but it's been uh, like many things that sort of gotten a boost recently through the use of deep networks because it, it's, uh, it can be used for sort of uh, approximating things uh, in, in the various functions which exist in RL. And the idea with RL is that unlike supervised learning or unsupervised learning, now what we want to do is we want to seek some intelligent agent, so that would be on the right, which can interact with an environment uh, and makes a sequence of decisions. So every time that the agent takes some action, so that in this example might be heating up or cooling down our spin lattice, or in a self-driving car, it would be sort of turning the, the steering wheel from one way to the other or the accelerator and so on, so on. So an agent takes some action on the environment, the environment is going to react in some way. Uh, you know, if you turn up the temperature of something, it heats up. If you turn left in your car, it starts to move to the left. Uh, and so it's going to return some new state based on the, the impact of that action. And then the, uh, the environment also will, you know, optionally return some reward. So you can have sort of sparse ward problems where an environment doesn't sort of tell you very much about whether or not things are going well, maybe just at the end of the game. Or you can have a, uh, a reward which is very frequent. So if you know, you're, let's say that you're at a casino and you're gambling and you're getting some money back, you can think about the money coming back as your reward because that's the, uh, the thing that you want to get a lot more of. And obviously, you know, there's sort of depending on some of these details in terms of how much comes back with the state or what the class of the reward is, some problems are sort of easier or harder to solve with reinforcement learning. So what we did is we said, okay, we want to treat this uh, this cooling problem, the problem of finding the ground state of some complicated spin system as a reinforcement learning problem. So how do we do that? So we're going to kind of zoom in on this nice visual. I think this might be, by, uh, just as an aside, I think this might be a project where the visualization and the flashy cover actually probably consumed more GPU time than the work <laughs> itself. Uh, you know, so uh, so sorry about that to our uh, the people who provide us with our, our hardware. But anyway, um, so, so what does Kyle put together here? Kyle was the PhD student. So the, the whole thing starts off with this idea that we have this spin lattice. You can see that there's the positive and the negative spins, and they're connected through this coupling, and they're sitting in some sort of temperature-controlled environment. This is the, the annealing system that you would use uh, in your simulator or, or perhaps some physical annealer like, uh, like on a D-Wave um, or um, you know the Fujitsu annealer. And so we have these spins, and we're able to observe the spins. In this case, there's a little visualization. You can see the GoPro, so we can sort of periodically check in to see how the spins are doing. And there's some temperature that this annealer is sitting at. And the uh, if we zoom out a little bit, you can see, okay, so the, this is our Hamiltonian, which is written on the wall. And the, uh, the, the oven where we're doing this simulation um, or, or in real life, has a temperature control which can sort of set what the target temperature is within the oven. So we know uh, that if you set the temperature very, very high, you'll explore lots of states, but you won't find the ground state. And we also know that if you set the temperature uh, very, very low, the system will kind of freeze and get stuck, uh, and you won't find the ground state either. And so people have kind of learned that there's this process called annealing, where you can sort of slowly turn the temperature down, uh, and if you wait very, very long, eventually you'll hit the thermodynamic ground state. The problem is, is that cooling rate can actually be quite slow and make it hard to use these things in practice. So here we have this temperature knob, uh, but rather than following a fixed protocol, what we're going to do is we're going to connect these observations that we get from our GoPro. We're going to come up with a representation that I'll talk about in a moment, and then we're going to pass it into a, uh, a network here. Uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit of detail as well, where the network is going to be the thing that makes the decisions about what we should do in the temperature in the next step. And so through this training process where the system gets feedback based on how low an energy you achieve for each run, this network on the bottle is going to learn how to achieve sort of a semi-optimal control policy for the annealing process. So just to show you the specifics of the network, so we've used a representation here where we're actually using a number of, uh, of spins which are annealing sort of in parallel to one another. So we concatenate these things together. So this is what our N reps are. The L is the size of the lattice. We have a couple dense layers and then connect this into something, uh, the, one of these LSTM models. So this is one of the kind of the sequence-based models that I talked about before. And then finally, the output layers these uh, define the uh, the distribution of the policy pi, which is the actual thing that makes the decision 
uh, and something called the value function, which is, you know, what value the network is a, is this accruing to particular microstates. The specific uh, RL algorithm that we use is called uh, proximal policy uh, optimization. And so the, the basically the, the way these things work is you, you have to put together a network that has those outputs here. So we, you know, the control that we have is kind of on the input representation, we can define things like the LSTM, uh, and then you sort of optimize it through PBO with the reference that's given there. Okay, so just a, a brief refresher, how, how are we going to sort of visualize the performance of these things? So, so now again, we have these nice triangles, which are the density of states. So this is the density of states for one of these spin systems. Um, it's, a, it's a bit more of a, a recent plot. So we've gotten better at some of these things than the, the kind of the plot that I showed you at the beginning of the talk from our earlier work. Um, and so just to remind you how to read these things. So the top of the triangle, these are these checkerboard patterns. This is obviously for the case of the ferromagnetic Ising model. We looked at a whole bunch of different uh, values of J and, and, and random systems, but just for simplicity, we'll focus on that one here. And the bottom, the lowest energy states are the all white or the all black for the ferromagnetic Ising model. And so now um, on this plot, what we're going to show is the actual trajectories that our reinforcement learning algorithm uh, learned through the process of the training. So it did lots and lots of training. Um, and it, initially, it didn't do very well in terms of, you know, it either took a very long time to get to the ground state or it never found the ground state. But these are a visualization of sort of the final trajectories where you can see that it started in some point, maybe towards the middle of the uh, of the triangle. So in one of those sort of highly disordered phases. And then it's following along that blue curve where it's sort of changing the temperature slowly. And you can see it sort of meandering down and eventually hits either the bottom left or the bottom right hand side of the uh, of the curve. So this is what sort of a successful trajectory looks like because the system was able to adjust the temperature as it went uh, and, and get to where it uh, to, to get to the ground state. And what we've the color bar here is uh, what we're plotting is something which is called the value function. So value function is a concept in uh, value based RL or reinforcement learning, where if you kind of think about what the current uh, iteration of your policy is, if you were to kind of roll out that policy all the way to the end of the game and then get the reward uh, at the end of the game and sort of um, uh, back it up over the states, the value is um, how good that state is to be in, right? So if you kind of, some states are clearly more valuable given the current policy than the other, and uh, you can kind of visualize a value function as a way of, uh, of getting a sense of what the, the neural network sort of decided was a good place to be in or was a bad place. Stars are four different configurations, all of which have the same energy because they're all on the same horizontal line, but the neural network has ascribed different value to each one of those things. And if you look at them, you've, there's a little inset which shows what the configuration is. And so they all have the same energy because they both have two domain walls, but the difference between them is the amount of the white upspin. So on the far left one, there's sort of an equal amount of say white and black, but on the one on the far right, there's less white. So they have the exact same energy, um, but the magnetization is a bit different. And the neural network has actually learned that there's more value on the ones towards the right. So in the reward signal that we use to train it, we only ever told the neural network what the energy was of the lowest configuration that it saw during the anneal. But it has picked up on the fact that the order parameter of magnetization is actually something that matters when you're trying to decide what the value of a state is because we want to get, or it has learned that states on the bottom right and the bottom left are the most valuable with reward. Uh, and so it has sort of, you know, on its own learned that even though it was only getting feedback about energy, it has learned that magnetization is actually a good indicator of whether or not it was good. Uh, and so it worked very well. So now, uh, how uh, how effective is this uh, is this method? So one of the ways that you can sort of optimize my systems like this is something called simulated annealing. And so here's a plot where we've run many many trials of different spin lattices searching for the ground state, and we're showing um, basically the number of trials that you need to have 99% confidence that you're going to get to the ground state. If you do simulated annealing for various lattice sizes, you'll see that simulated annealing has a particular scaling in terms of how many of these things you have to run to get to the ground state. Uh, but then depending on whether you do sort of destructive or non-destructive measurements uh, in RL, then you can actually beat that. So the, uh, the reinforcement learning agent has actually learned how to, uh, to 
improve on these things uh, and come up with a better outcome. Okay, so I think at this point, just sort of uh, looking at the time, I think it probably makes sense if we, uh, I'm going to skip this last part and I will jump to the conclusions. Um, so uh, I, I guess I want to argue that, uh, you know, sort of simple models, the ones that I've talked about today, really help us kind of understand how and why uh, deep learning works. There's a, a lot of excellent work that's going on in the community um, where sort of people are applying it to experimental data and to sort of, sort of electronic structure. And, and you know, we, we've done some of this ourselves. But I really like the simple models because there's, you know, there, there's no sort of, uh, there's no hidden things. Everybody can understand sort of spin interactions uh, classically. Um, and so it's a really beautiful testing ground, in my opinion, to try some of these algorithms to sort of refine them as well, you know, because we, we want to build new things that are specific to, to physics and science. Up, but uh, I assure you, uh, I, I personally enjoy very much the talk and I, I'm, I'm sure also the people out there. So, um, yes, so uh, essentially, Please feel free to uh, ask any questions, and maybe I'll I'll kick off the conversation since uh, um, we know that there's a little bit of delay between the broadcast and the and the YouTube broadcast. Um, maybe I, just going back to um, when to the very beginning when you discuss uh, the uh, Isen model and density of state, uh, if you like. Uh, but then uh, you know the density of sampling was much much poorer uh, at the edge of your uh, magnetization curve, essentially. And uh, um, I just wondered, actually, so so here, in a sense, uh, it's a model, as you, as you correctly said, is, is very under control. So you know exactly where to look now. So let's suppose now you have a data set and it's much more tricky to define uh, a matrix. So it's much more difficult to analyze the data and then to know whether you're under sampling or over sampling something. Is there some sort of a way to understand actually how this is happening? Sure. So, I mean, generally speaking, um, you want to make sure that you have an uh, an even distribution with respect to the uh, observable that you're trying to predict. So, in our case, um, the sampling protocol, which we sort of we did naively, but also I knew it was wrong in the beginning, but I thought it would be a good baseline. Is yeah. we said let's just take random spins. It, you know, I, I wasn't clear initially why it was wrong, but I thought let's figure out why it's wrong. And so, random feels like it should be somehow unbiased. Um, but when you think about it, actually random is quite biased in the sense that most random things are disordered. And so mm. what where you actually get stuck with the supervised learning is that then you have lots of examples that all sort of in our case had the same energy and they had very, very similar magnetization. I mean, they weren't identical, but they were similar. And so the, the thing on supervised ML is, um, you know, uh, if you're basically defining your loss over the sample that you took, if you know if 99% of your data has a value of zero as the answer, then of course the model will just always say zero, right? Um, this is a problem with sort of that people have with kind of rare diseases and modeling mm -hmm. as well too. And so the fix is uh, there's two ways you can do it. So one of them is you just sort of look at your distribution over the observable and you push for an even distribution over your observable. Uh, or you can weight your loss differently so that uh, the loss picks up this, this weighting thing. So I would say if you're kind of in a less controlled system, you really want to look at what property am I trying to predict? So maybe it's band gap or maybe it's, uh, you know, the energy above hull or conductivity or something like that. And you want to make sure that you have examples that kind of go across the full range of possibilities with respect to, to that particular property. So, so that's the thing that you have to look at. Um, and, uh, yeah. So, so. Yeah. No. I, yeah. Thanks. And um, maybe another question still for me is um, when you discuss your uh, this this uh, this very interesting wrapping methods to uh, somehow you know reconstruct your magnetization curve from a single temperature observation. I mean, how how is this method dependent on the fact that you're looking at a relatively short range model? So, I mean, is is. Um, are the deta I mean, is, is the principle still withstand if you have a model where the interaction is very long range or or, the, or is there anything specific of the ASIM model here? So we, in that particular work, so we looked at the, uh, we, we looked at random couplings as well, which were short ranged. Um, so it's not specific to, to having uniform couplings at all. So it definitely works for random short range couplings. I suspect that as you get longer and longer range interactions, then uh, your so basically as your correlation length goes up, 
in terms of the interaction range, which, which you're going to have in that case, then if you kind of think about it, the patterns themselves will be kind of come longer range, um, that you're going to emerge in your data. And, um, you know, something simple like a recurrent neural network will have difficulty with very, very long patterns. Uh, and so this was sort of the problem that people had in the early days of trying to do sort of like semantic meaning and text that uh, recurrent neural networks that can only sort of maintain some idea so far back in, uh, in, in time within the sequence. Um, so I think probably the naive uh, RNNs that we used here probably would fail in the longer range interactions. Mm. But that said, there's actually... Um, in the past couple of years, a lot of the, the sequence-based models uh, for things like translation and so forth, they've actually switched over away from these recurrent units into attention-based mechanisms. So the, mm -hmm. the, the paper is called Transformers. And Transformers have extremely long range uh, capabilities. And so I think that, uh, I think a Transformer could probably handle the, the longer range interactions well, um, just based on how well they've done on, on sequences of text, which are really long range. So there, to, to answer, yeah, I think the RNNs would fail, but I think transformers would probably be able to, to help out there. Okay. Uh, okay, so um, I have a question from the, from the audience, from uh, um, Rajashi Tivari, who is in, in my group. And essentially the question is the following. Um, in traditional thermodynamics, we normally do importance sampling. Um, but it seems that in order to learn better, one should keep in mind that unimportant, unimportant sampling. So can, can you comment on that? Yeah. Um, so you basically, it depends on what you're trying to recover. So if you, the reason that you want unimportant sampling, I guess I would say when you're training a, a supervised learning model is because you want to make sure that if your system does happen to hit one of those rare events, it's giving you something which is vaguely correct. Um, if you're trying to then estimate some thermodynamic property, um, then, mm -hmm. then, you know, then we can use sort of traditional importance sampling again, but really what you want to do is make sure that your model handles, uh, both the, the common and the rare events and actually rare events, uh, sampling is something that, uh, you know, is a, probably an entire other, uh, lecture, um, that, uh, you know, we, we've got a paper with a colleague of mine, uh, Steve Whitelum from, uh, from Berkeley lab, where we've been sort of focusing on, uh, on looking at actually rare events with, uh, with sort of evolutionary algorithms. But yeah, no, you, some of the rules of thumb are, are the same as sort of traditional thermodynamics and then other ones you have to kind of adopt your thinking a little bit or adapt your thinking a little bit with ml okay um okay i don't see any more questions here um okay maybe i give another 15 seconds if somebody has any any um, other burning question um otherwise i guess i can't we can uh, uh maybe conclude the talk here um maybe just uh, so one question for me, I mean, again, for me, I mean, once you do the uh, the extensive neural network, right? So this, I would say, if you come from a slightly different community, this sounds to me like doing, if you like, a local density approximation to something. Is, is, is that the spirit? It is, yeah. So my, my, my background really is electronic structure. Um, and so it's very much like a local density approximation. Mm. The nice thing about the the sort of these extensive uh, networks that we came up with is that you can um, you can kind of vary what the range of that approximation is, right? So within the local density approximation, you're literally talking about local, like on site. Uh, and then if you go to something like a, a gradient corrected one, then you're, you know, you're including maybe two sites or something or two or four or something like this. Uh, whereas we actually have now a hyperparameter, which is this context region. So in principle, you can look as far as you want. Um, and what's really nice about it is that you can actually let the data itself tell you what that range is. So the, the more context that you include within your system, the longer it will take to train um, but, uh, the closer potentially you will get to a total energy. And so we actually use that as a, uh, we, we use that as a way of determining what the, what the effective range is. And, and what we find is on sort of on thing, it, it, it actually behaves exactly like you would expect. So when we've done it on, uh, on charge densities, you know, the LDA, you can, you don't necessarily need to use such a long context, uh, versus something like if you were to apply it. Uh, we haven't checked it yet on the hybrid, but my intuition would be that if you reuse some sort of like long range hybrid exchange type functional on it, then you would you would want to include more context. So. I mean, how, how does met, how this method work? If if there's something we can describe quickly. 
Uh, the the extensive neural network is that what you're asking? No, no, no. I mean this this way where you somehow establish the range of interact. I mean automatically from the data you establish the range of interaction. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it's basically it's a hyperparameter optimization. So what okay. that means is you will take your data and you choose a few different uh, window sizes for that context. So it's a free parameter. So you can try and optimize that. So you, you set the context. Uh, you know, sort of sort of two cells, we'll say, uh, and then you can try it with three and four and five. And then you just run the the training, your regression mm -hmm. with these different sizes. Right. And then what you'll find is that if the context is too small, if you haven't included enough in the field of view, you won't be able to converge your loss function to a good result. Right. And if you include too much, you'll converge, but it will take a lot of training to get it. And if you hit it right at the optimal one, you'll hit that same value, but it won't take very much training. So it's just a hyper opti hyper parameter optimization within the loss function. Uh, so the data itself basically tells you what the answer is. Yeah, understood. Okay. All right. Um, okay, so I don't see any more questions, so maybe we can close here. So let me thank uh, um, Isaac again for the seminar and uh, all of you uh, out there for listening. And um, there's going to be another seminar next week, uh, the same time on Wednesday. Um, so we'll post the uh, information on YouTube and um, um, the mailing list. Thanks a million. Yeah, thanks very much. And if you have any questions, feel free to email me. So thanks for watching.